my friends, this is Wolfgang with Tools for Ascension. And today we will be having a channeling session with Robin. And we will be talking to a high self that calls herself Raj. And Raj is kind of means controller, a ruler. Um, she's coming, you know, from very close to source. Um, but, you know, we don't take this necessary as face value. Um, we rather judge the information that comes through, whether it's uplifting or not, you know, whether it's, you know, there is novelty to it or whether it's just a repetition of all the stuff that's already available. You know, we are looking for the novelty, you know, for the new thing, not the stuff that has been around for several thousands of years. All right. Um, so, uh, Robin, um, could you just quickly introduce them yourself? What are the services that you're you offering? I, um, I work for myself with Empath Central, and I mainly help empaths and highly sensitive people learn how to exist in this realm in a way that they're thriving and they're able to navigate their sensitivities in a way that benefits everyone around them. And I also do life coaching and camp counseling and channeling and energy readings, just about anything. Yeah, so it's like the Swiss army knife of spirituality. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Everybody needs something different, so. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and all the psychic people there, you know, definitely empaths. So, uh, you know, so you basically help you know and yeah and empaths come you know there's a lot of problems it's like a sensitive microphone you don't take this to a heavy metal concert <laughs> and um so um this time we will be um, channeling information about love and lust and sensuality this whole package right and um, if you're prude uh, or you know you already have your opinion well, um, you know, there is this um, off button that you can use, you, can, um, you know, go out to something else. Um, if you're open-minded, um, well, you are our people, you know, and um, of course only accept what resonates with you. And of course, also use your head, make sure it makes sense, you know, nobody here wants to go off the deep end. So, um, let's just um, call in on your um, divine guidance, um, Raj. Let's call in on her. And of course, we already have prepared spiritually. We have invoked protection, etc. Um, so, Robin doesn't just start cold like this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Lots of preparation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just let me know when she is there and ready to communicate. She's ready. All right. So the first question is, well, beyond reproduction, you know, why are humans um, drawn to love? So, I mean, we see all over the animal kingdom, as shown on the internet, mammals, lizards, birds, fish, all seem to like petting, for instance, <laughs> you know, even hunter, prey, um, cross species of um, love and relationships um, seem to be there, um, especially if there's no food shortage. Mm -hmm. uh, when we incarnate into human form, one of the main reasons is obviously to learn lessons and one of those lessons being emotions. And one of the best ways to learn about emotion is through experiencing another person in our energy field. And we're drawn towards people, we're drawn towards love for that mirroring experience, for that growth, for that expansion, for learning our emotions and how to feel and, and what it feels like to love, to, to have that touch with another person, or like you had mentioned with animals, it's just part of our incarnations as humans learning about emotion. Hmm. So, uh, love seems to be 
like the really cherished emotion you know, yes. of them all. Uh, you know, maybe uh, other ecstasy. I mean, you know, there's very few emotions that seem to be better than love. And of course, um, just like anything that's really good, um, you know, there's a lot of demand for that. Mm. <laughs> and there come issues, you know, of supply and demand. So when we look at the primate uh, world, you know, our closest cousins, the bonobos, chimps and gorillas, uh, they all seem to be having like a, a harem system. <laughs> You know, where many females gather around a provider and, and protect him, you know, the, the tough guy, the gray back gorilla, and, um, and compete you know, for the attention. We may even um, see similar practices in, in spiritual culture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like you know, Christian spiritual cults, you know, uh, where uh, you know one male, alpha male, you know, gathers a lot of females around that you know they provide. Um, then of course we have bonobos, you know, that are very free love um, principle, just like hippies. It seems they're very happy. So this whole harem, uh, you know, we are, we are multi-armorous <laughs> or poorly armorous, <laughs> you know, or we just want to have a lot of partners and, and or, you know, or we want to have only one partner. Um, so what is the spiritual idea, you know, behind those contradicting systems? It's ego. A lot of it is ego based when there's the competition, the, the need to, or the, the feeling of wanting to be, if it's the male aspect and we all have male and female, so I'm not polarizing men and women, um, when the male aspect steps forward in that manner of wanting to have that ego reinforced that's a a bit of a lower she's telling me it's a bit, or, a bit of a lower vibration and when the females are competitive and jealous and wanting to compete that's also a bit of a lower vibration it's not necessarily good bad in between it's just a different vibration of existence and then there are other vibrations where the love is more free flowing and that can really vary as well. I mean, it can get to a point where it's too free flowing so that the vibration lowers if certain needs aren't being met by the people involved. Raj is letting me know that a lot of love, true love, is for all of creation. It's not just for male and female. And that that rush that we get of happy chemicals when we're in romantic love, love is much more than that. It's connecting. It's connecting to all of creation. And putting it into certain categories lowers the vibration of the pure essence of love. Oh, that is um, definitely a very beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful explanation. Now, you really rose my interest when you said too much free-flowing love. So how would that look like? If there's no... Raj is showing me if there's no stability in the sense of addressing the chakra systems. Obviously, we have more than just our seven chakras, but if we're looking at just the seven that we mainly focus on, if we're too in just the energy of free flowing, let's say the higher chakras, and we're just existing in that flow state, which is beautiful and sparkly and wonderful and fun. And it feels amazing. But you might starve to death because you're not addressing security, stability. 
power center, creativity. So she's showing me that it needs to be, it, ideally, she's correcting me, not needs. There, all of it can exist. There's not anything that's better than the other. But ideally, meeting the needs of each of your chakras is ideal. Then there's balance. Then it's not just free-flowing heart chakra love and higher dimensional aspects, but then you also have security and stability and creativity and power all in one package. Yeah, so basically what she is describing is like the space cadet, you know, where yes. you're only in your higher chakras and you're right. not grounded at all. Right. And then you cannot pay the rent and right. have a problem holding on to a job. You cannot manifest anything. You know? So to be able to manifest properly and to live in harmony with the physical world, you definitely have to have a you know powerful root chakra, foot chakras, and the lower three chakras have to be balanced properly. You know, if you have issues there, um, yeah, it's going to be really rough in your earth life. Mm -hmm. And of course, you, then it's a good time to look into past lifetimes and see, you know, how you know where these disturbances are coming from um so let's just still you know so it, it seems like um the higher the vibration of the couple or of you know the parties involved um the less the ego and the more um, a multi-amorous relationship can be maintained and you know of course the multi-armorous relationship, I think, also has to be extended to the world around us, the trees, the crystals, and, and all the other living beings. You know, I mean, birds respond, definitely. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my, my wife described uh, this morning, she picked up on the porch, we, we feed birds, she picked up a blue, you know, she stepped to the perch, all the birds were greeting her. You know, the big, ah, you know, they, they like her. And then she picked up the feather of a, of a, this is a, the blue ray, um, anyhow, blue feather, you know, a smart species, doesn't come up to me right now. And she said it was dead silent when she put it into her head. So they were all watching her. I mean, she said dead silent. <laughs> so something really happened that impressed those birds. And when I walk in nature, then I project love. Yeah, it's it's very ecstatic. You know? It's uh, like being in love with a girlfriend, and definitely, or maybe even better, <laughs> you know, because it's from all around. Mm -hmm. So um, again, is it what I find now many times when people, uh, even high vibrational, get into a relationship? You know, all their stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the stuff with their mother, yes. know, from, from the guys, of course, with their father, from for the women, and uh, their old relationship in this lifetime, past lifetime, and then there are ghosts and curses and, and you know, love spells and promises. <laughs> so it seems like, <laughs> like a lost battle. <laughs> you know, how can we have a decent relationship? Yes. nowadays you know with so many interferences yes the what she's showing me is that that what you've described is obviously what's most common still on the planet at this time most people are drawn to partners <laughs> that reflect the gender of the person that caused them the most trauma in their childhood and they're drawn to that to replay on a subconscious level. And it's like a second chance to heal those wounds. Our subconscious feels drawn to that, but that's more third dimensional. And then she's also saying, like you had mentioned, there are sometimes past lives with these people where that karma needs to be healed and it's coming forward for that to be addressed if we're aware and there's also curses and love spells and there's all that lower vibrational energy that is the primary 
pool of relationships on earth at this time. And she's letting me know that the more people can, that they clear their own energy and that they're aware, she's happy we're making people aware of this. Um, and the more that we're aware that that's what's going on and we go in and we heal those wounds, we do past life healing, we do healing regarding whatever gender of parent or parents or both or caregiver, whoever it was that we had trauma with, we go in and we heal those things. We, we negate and learn how to get rid of the love spells and the curses. And it's, it's an opportunity to heal. And as those things get healed, if you're able to find another person who has also healed as much as possible, I mean, that can go on and on and on, then there's a greater chance of the love being much more pure, much more solid, much more stable, as she's saying, much more fulfilling, because there's not all that junk that's involved, but she's showing me most of the planet at least 80%, probably more, they're still stuck in all that other stuff. So it, it's a bit of a challenge at this time, but she's saying we're getting there, we're getting there. People are healing and that it will, it will get better. <laughs> yeah, the way I look at it, I mean, when I see what's behind the curtain, <laughs> you know, it's a... Uh, tough work you really have to be in love with each other and to want to overcome all this you know? yes. so it's a lot of work uh, but it's um, uh, you know very fruitful if you can uh, you know get to the bottom of those issues I mean what I discovered even in my relationship you know with my mother and, and parents and other relatives from past lifetimes it's gory it's gory, you know? very harsh stuff very harsh, like a slasher movie and some of those things. And so then you get stuck with those people. Now, um, so many of us, they have been really burned by relationships. <laughs> and they say, uh -uh, you know, I'm done with this and I don't want to go through this. Um, I'd rather stay by myself and not suffer, you know, stay kind of balanced. And because I'm always attracting the same catastrophic partners. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there are, you know, whole um, sections of, you know, spiritual hardcore people like nuns, you know, monks, yogis, renunciants that stay celibate, you know, for this particular reason to simplify their life, not to be distracted. You know, my um, one of my gurus used to say, if you think you're enlightened, get married. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and see how much stuff you still have. So, uh, Raj, what would you like to say? Yes, she's uh, very much in agreement. And she's showing me that, that, that relationships are the highest way of learning many, many, many lessons. She's showing me like a book, like this is the biggest book <laughs> for learning. When you enter into a relationship, and there's a reason for the patterns of the people that you're drawn to. And if you can address those reasons and heal those wounds, that's like a huge, she's showing me like a badge, like a badge of courage. Like that's a really big deal um, because it's, it's rough. I'm, she's, she's showing me that that's like one of the biggest, biggest, most difficult lessons is it, exchanging that love with another person and then having them trigger so many things in you that you didn't realize you needed to heal. If you're a monk or a nun, you don't get those triggers. And so you, sure, you stay in alignment and that's, it depends on your calling. If you need to always be in that pure alignment then sure, stay celibate. If you're if you came into this realm to heal, 
a lot of that past karma. And she's saying a lot of people here now, the light workers are here to heal family lines. And that by experiencing these patterns in relationships, we are healing the entire family line that's been stuck in these patterns for a very long time. So it's not that being a monk or a nun is necessarily holier <laughs> than someone who's healing a whole family lineage. So there's varying aspects. Sure, it's divine to keep yourself in alignment, keep yourself protected, not be messed with. But if you're in that vibration, you're not going to be doing the other work of healing. So it's just a matter of choice. It's a matter of what we chose, what lessons we chose to learn when we came in, what path we chose, what our reasons are for this lifetime. Thank you, Raj. Um, I have to completely agree with you what you said. Um, personally, I uh, was celibate for about 12 years, I mean, voluntarily. And um, so it was very helpful, um, you know, to, to stay on the course emotionally and also uh, study my own mind. <laughs> um, see, you know, how it's react, how it is conditioned by, by culture, lust, etc. You know, so and of course, see women in a completely different perspective. You know, it was very helpful. I'm not saying, you know, anybody should do this, <clears throat> um, but at least I had the experience. And of course, I'm married now, and I have to admit, if I wouldn't have been married and had responsibility with children, I would have walked probably many times. You know, because, yeah, <laughs> you know, I married my mother. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I was not too happy with my mother. And so, um, but it's definitely the fast track, I have to say. Now, um, so uh, what's her, so for many, you know, marriage seems to be like, you know, a slave color. And for some, it's more like a, a, a commitment and a heaven, you know, like a, a sanctuary, you know, to work out your stuff, your karma. So uh, what is her, you know, perspective on, on marriage, you know, on this committed institution? Um, she's she's showing me the symbol of a dove, and I'm trying to see what she why she's showing that to me. And interestingly enough, when you were describing um, your relationship experiences, there was a loud boom outside. My <laughs> so I apologize. I think I'm a little distracted, but that's a, it's kind of interesting. Um, so she's showing me a dove. And she's showing me that is it is a sacred union and that it depends on, okay, it's very individualized for some people staying in a union like that if they feel secure, supported, and that they're both, okay, she's showing me that they're both growing that both partners are growing, learning, expanding, and developing, that it's a beautiful, sacred, divine way of growth. And then she's also showing me a chain, the old ball and chain, I guess, um, where if someone is in a marriage that is very toxic, where they're being shown that Okay, she's showing me like bitterness, if bitterness is developing and resentfulness because one partner's growing, the other one isn't, and they, the person stays just because society tells them that's the holy thing to do, yet they're resenting their partner. How holy is it? <laughs> so it's a matter of, is there growth? Is there development? Is there healing? And then if it gets to a point where there's more damage being done than healing and growing, that it's okay to say, this is enough. It's, this isn't helping either person and forgive and learn and grow. And that by 
letting the other person go because she's showing me that a lot of primarily female energies tend to stay thinking that they're doing the right thing, that they're helping the other person somehow just by staying, but then they build up resentment and bitterness and they're projecting that at their partner day in and day out. How beneficial is it? So it's a matter, it, it's individualized. She's saying marriage isn't just one size fits all. It depends on each person's life path, each person's journey, their past lives, and and so many, many, many facets to it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, as an illustration, um, I once saw uh, an Indian couple, uh, Brahmana family, highly intelligent, about in their 70s, and walking side by side, and oh my God, were they angry at each other. <laughs> But they were still married. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I just, you know, saw the outburst of anger and this bitterness, this is kind of like an olive, yellowish olive, it's like, you know, gall, bladder, you know, just moving over to the other, they both were super toxic, you could see it in their skin and in their anger and their mouth expression, and I mean, yeah, it was... You know, it's like a black hole or, you know, exuding <laughs> negativity. And, um, you know, and uh, my, what I can get as, as next is that there was no forgiveness. Yes. You, know, you have to forgive each other, especially when you live with each other day in, day out. You know, see each other in the morning, you know, without the makeup. And, uh, and so on, you know, uh, you see the dark side from them. And uh, of course, we all have different opinions. You know? And so, of course, you have to compromise. And if this done without forgiveness, um, it makes the relationship toxic. You know, if I like just blow up, it's a 10,000 time. I told you not to put the comb into the water. You know, it's... Um, That has to be worked out, and if it doesn't, you know, it's definitely very, very toxic. So I, I think forgiveness is, you know, a big one. Now you said, um, yeah, if you want to talk about forgiveness, actually, that's what be a nice thing. Uh, she, she's taking me back to the book. She was showing me the big book, um, that this is a big, big lesson, the whole dynamic of love relationships, romantic love relationships, and that the chapter on forgiveness is very long. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, she's showing me it's, it's, it's pretty big um, because it is something that needs to be, okay, I'm hearing regulated, interesting. Okay, it's not just the act of sending forgiveness, it's also forgiving yourself and allowing yourself to, I'm trying to see what she's showing me, allowing yourself to be loved in return. Self-love, she's saying self-love is part of forgiveness and not just being oozing, <laughs> she's showing me like oozing um, forgiveness and acceptance and all of that for the other person constantly it'll be like a leak that's what she's showing me it'll be like a leak on your body your mind your soul your spirit so yes forgiveness is very 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 needed in order to maintain a relationship but it needs to be both ways it needs to be for yourself as well and not just letting yourself drain and let the other person just draw from your love, your forgiveness, and then you become very weak and depleted. It has to be a balance. And um, just tuning into that whole energetic exchange, it, it needs, there, there needs to be healthy boundaries. And She's showing me, like you had mentioned, you, you wake up to the same person and they don't have their hair combed or they don't have their makeup on and it's day in and day out for decades. What if you wake, wake up in the morning and you think, who is this wonderful creature that's next to me and discover something new 
about them for that day. And she's also showing and discover something wonderful about you for that day as well. And she keeps repeating self-love is just as important as showing love to the other person and acceptance and forgiveness. It has to be balanced where one will get drained, just totally energetically drained. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think she's hinting at a very, very important point that I found is very crucial in a relationship. You know, this is the point I'm calling, I'm losing you. Mm-hmm. You know, you fall in love and you know, you have the high and then, you know, you start drifting away. You know, this horrible feeling, I'm losing you. And mm-hmm. so whenever, um, you know, I had this experience where the other person was, you know, withdrawing from me, it, you know, I was at that state, how can I change myself to better suit <laughs> your needs? Which is, of course, complete (laughs) self-denial. And I mean, who likes a lovesick puppy, you know, to follow them around? You know, we all want to have the unattainable. (laughs) So to say, you know, that's the biggest thrill. Um, Of course, it's ego-driven, but um, nobody likes really smothering love uh, as such. So um, the priority seems to be being able to love yourself and have a connection to your own uh, love so you're not dependent on the other. Does she have any um, suggestion of how to do this best in a relationship where you tend to lose yourself in the other? Oh, I only can be happy with Rosemary or with Bobby, right? And so. Right. Yeah, self, self-love, self which is a big overused term, um, but she's showing me that keeping each of your own chakras really tended to and having your own sense of identity that is separate from the other and allowing the other person to have their own identity that is separate from you. And then she's showing me and committing to each other's chakras, each one in a healthy way. And okay, and she's showing me hard work and that it's hard work and that relationships for them to be fulfilling, long lasting, non-toxic, non-draining, it's work. And if between two people, if each partner agrees to commit to, let's say, their root chakra stability, how can I make this person feel safe? What does that mean to them? What does it mean to me? Staying on top of making sure that that's going on. The sacral chakra, how can I bring this person pleasure? How can they bring me pleasure? How can I support their creativity? How can they do that for me? Going up, you know, the going up to the solar plexus, how can I empower this person? How can they empower me and exchanging that and so on up to the heart? How can I support their heart? How can I let them know they're loved? Going up to communication, the throat, am I allowing the other person to communicate? Am I listening? Am I really listening? Is there open communication? Is there acceptance? Going up further, are they supporting me spiritually? Am I supporting them spiritually? Are we helping each other to see, to grow, to have vision beyond this realm? And then do they help me connect to the divine? And do I help them connect to the divine? And staying on top of that and maintaining that makes things a lot smoother she's showing me yes it's a lot of work but it's a lot more work to (laughs) to be stuck and feeling drained and feeling discouraged or anything like that if if you're able to maintain that for each other it's a lot more beautiful a lot more stable a lot more fulfilling so it looks like she's shifting the perception to the subtle body Mm-hmm. I mean, humans have been trained, you know, to keep their outer appearance nice, 
you know, yeah. you may, you know, if you are, you know, up to the task, go to the gym, have decent clothing on, and smell fine and have good nutrition. Um, but that doesn't, that's just the material side of a relationship, you know, the looks and the appearance. Mm -hmm. On the subtle body, um, you know, that has to be also manicured properly. This is like a garden, you know, to make it look nice. <laughs> you know, it's going to take some some work. And um, so there is this, you know, concept of a relationship like based on, on chakras. You know, let's say, um, you know, you have, this is your heart chakra, so he has more heart chakra than this, and he's maybe more grounded. You know, so there is, um, so he has, you know, what, what she needs and she has what he needs, so to say. Um, so is there a way? I mean, let's say, for instance, he is very grounded and a good provider and she's a space cadet, you know, and has, uh, but decorates your place very nicely, let's hope. You know, she's not a slob. <laughs> and um, so they're both a benefit from each other. So can you say a little bit more about, you know, com you know, there is the sameness and there's also compatibility by difference. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and she's showing me the zodiac. <laughs> and yes, there will be compatibility amongst partners where, like you were describing, some may be earth signs and they may be attracted to an air sign <laughs> because they do help balance each other. And that's beautiful. And she's also showing me that the other components, if, if you're able to, and keeping those balanced at the same time is ideal, but not, she keeps saying, but it's not happening much on earth at this time. <laughs> um, but yes, we are often drawn to people who can help balance our energy as long as it doesn't get to a point where let's say somebody that's a space cadet marries somebody that is super grounded and the space cadet loses touch with the third dimension and with reality entirely how healthy is that and what if the person that's grounded all they do is work and that's it and they never get right. connected there has to be balance she keeps bringing me back to balance but yes there is the attraction there <laughs> yes well i mean balance and that i mean she helps the space cadet you know awakens the spiritual side in the materialist and you know gets provided for and they say of course that you know there should be a balance um so um now you also mentioned that we come here you know in our love life to also heal the family line and in my work yes <laughs> you know ancestors is a big thing and um do you know the ancestors may say oh never one of those <laughs> you know we don't want this in our family line mm -hmm. Um, this race, that race, that clan, and this clan, and uh, also lots of curses onto the family line, onto marriage, onto fertility, and vows. And, you know, much of that karma is often the, um, you know, deserved, you know, plus then personal stuff. Ah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, um, somehow I, I know a lot of this stuff, but common people, you know, I mean, I don't know, there seems to be insurmountable mountains, you know, that they have to work through. So what's her opinion? You know, how to how do normal folks or people that are waking up, <laughs> they help, you know, heal their, their family life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's, she was showing me people that are awake at this time or more awake that a lot of us <laughs> she's showing me that they jumped in like in these uh, what are those called like a parachute what do they wear like a jumpsuit jumpsuit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they were <laughs> they're the brave souls that dove in right now to heal the family lines because like she was showing me again the majority of the planet is not aware why they were attracted to someone why their family line has certain patterns beyond psychology. Obviously, there is that aspect of um, 
work, but as far as the spiritual realm, a lot of people are not yet aware of what's going on. It's super brave souls that are here right now, healing those toxic family patterns. And she's showing me more and more that it's like a momentum. The more that that gets going, the more other people will be aware and the more that that will shift the dynamic of relationships on the planet. But it's going to take time because the majority of people don't know why they have, they may have a family lineage that has curses, like you mentioned, and they have no clue and they can't figure out why they can't work through something. But without that insight, they're not going to know. So it's just a matter of time. The more it's like a flame, one one starts it and it just, it starts to spread. So the more people wake up, and see that, yes, there are multiple spiritual facets as to why we're in certain relationships and how to heal those through past life clearing, um, karma clearing, lineage healing, and just lots of karma work, lots of forgiveness both ways. Um, But the more that that's done, the more it will purify the relationships on the planet. It will take time. It will definitely take time. Uh, Yeah, it it seems like it. I mean, uh, maybe 30, 40 years ago, vegetarianism, you know, was something new. You know, what, you're vegetarian? You know, what is this? Are you crazy? (laughs) And now it's, um, you know, very common, you know, intelligent, many other thousand people, you know, they're practicing this. So I think it will come. Um, Hopefully it's not the suffering that will you know, lead them towards investigating what they have to say. It's generally the suffering. That's why yes. they come to me. They're suffering. They can't stand it anymore. They don't know what's going on. They tried everything else. You know? And uh, very little people, uh, very few therapists deal with ghost curses, you yes. know, vows and things like this. And, yes. and you know, this the uh, can wake you till you're blue in the face. And it's right. not going to change much. <laughs> right. So, yeah, here's another question. Um, so, why are so many men in spiritual community now calling themselves alpha males and using that as an excuse for having multiple women? Yes. Uh, I never call myself an alpha male. Right. Right. Yeah, she's, she's showing again ego. It's obviously ego based. And <laughs> she's also telling me an alpha never has to announce that they're an alpha. So if they're they're announcing that they're an alpha, they may want to take a second look. (laughs) Because being an alpha is being a leader. Leaders don't announce, hey, I'm the leader. They show it. They, They live by example. Leaders and alphas don't awaken love in someone and then leave them high and dry and move on to the next person, which is, she's showing me a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of the male energy in the spiritual community right now is thinking that that's what an alpha is. I can awaken someone and then move on to the next one, but they're, they're not yet seeing that being an alpha is being is a huge responsibility of being a true leader, someone that actually takes care of their those that they oversee. They're not going to just focus on one aspect and move on. It's ego based. It's it's very ego based. And the the females that are drawn in to those that are pro- proclaiming that they're an alpha may want to take a look at why are they drawn to that? Why are they drawn to someone that has that superficial ego going on? What is it about them that's being drawn to that energy? What is it? Again, it could be past life. It could be childhood trauma, whatever it may be. Go in and look at that heal it so that you're not drawn to the outer shell proclaiming their their ego so it's both both needs 
healing at this time and and it will happen but right now yes she's showing me like a pattern yes it is a pattern but she keeps saying alphas don't have to announce it <laughs> yeah that's uh, funny and, and definitely uh, yeah good. so <clears throat> well but you know i personally i i think that you know uh, i mean so many of my female clients, you know, they are all attracted to the bad boys. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just probably straight Darwinism. You know? I mean, you took shelter of, you know, the bad ass that, um, you know, whatever male that would protect you and your family, you know, and provide, you know. Um, uh, initially, I think uh, picking a male was not about love. It was about survival. So what does she think about it? Yes, very, very much so that it's it's a lower vibration, which we're moving out of, but it's taking time. But yes, that is based on survival, which as the planet ascends more and more, that won't be as much of a focus. But instinctually, yes, of course, um, the female aspect of us is drawn to a protector, a provider, definitely. And in... Okay, hold on. She's showing me movies. Okay, she's showing me programming. That's what it is. And programming is also playing a role in why women are drawn to the so-called bad boys. It's programming. It's a lot of overlays. It's a lot of when you're watching a movie, a television program, whatever, they glamorize the bad boys and that it's a romantic thing to be wanted by someone like that. And she's showing me it's a lot of programming. It's not just the primal nature of wanting to make sure that you're safe. It's a lot of third dimensional programming as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I noticed that, um, especially with the older movies, so whenever the hero, um, you know, is talking, something important is happening, they're shugging some whiskey, <laughs> some alcohol is involved, many times they were smoking, this is soda water, not rosé here, and um, they, when they're cops, they're breaking the rules, Mm -hmm. You know, and, and rough up the victims, you know, and right. of course, it's always justified, so you shear them on, ah, yes, right. you know, he's, a, he's a bad being, you know, you can yeah. do this now, now stomp him, you know, so, to, uh, you know, they're trying to get you to condone uh, violence because you yeah. think it's appropriate, so it's a very mis misleading yeah, and and when we watch programs, there's a reason they're called programs. And when you're watching television or a movie for a while, our brains go into a theta state, which is what we use in hypnotherapy. And so you're putting that into your subconscious. So there's part of you as a human <laughs> that may have that programmed, I, whether it's a male thinking, I need to be a bad boy to get the pretty girl, or the female thinking, I, you know, I need to be with the bad boy, you know, it, it's a lot of its programming, she's showing me they're storing it in our brains, and that it's not, at this point in time, it's not about survival anymore, in most cases, I mean, in some cases, it could be, you may need someone big and strong to protect you. But by and large in our society, that's not what's needed. And yet the programs are still running. Mm -hmm. Well, also what I find funny now, this is about male role archetype, mm -hmm. that in uh, so many movies and so many genres, um, even sci-fi movies, the ultimate decision is always, you know, done with a slug out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah. coughs> As if this is the solution. I mean, if I... <laughs> Um, I definitely can do this in, in this reality if I wanted to, uh, but I tell you, after one or two or three times, you know, trying to settle something, I probably have a probation officer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Right. So uh, it does not work. It's some, you know, the wrong programming. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, how can you lose all, you know, your problems with kung fu? Mm -hmm. or with this and that, or being a good marksman. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> so definitely, um, you know, very misleading. Um, probably have to watch more French talkies, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> the 
So we talked a little bit about this, you know, pure, healthy, romantic love and from her perspective, no romantic love, right? Um, so uh, the balanced way in essence. Yeah, she's, she keeps leading me back um, to addressing the whole person with romantic love and, and how those beautiful chemicals of oxytocin and dopamine and all of that that gets going in the beginning of a relationship, that that's not enough to sustain over time a healthy relationship that it needs to be nurtured, that it needs to be tended to, that it needs to be taken care of. And if each partner is willing to do that, then, okay, she's showing me that you can keep the oxytocin and dopamine going by, by communication and by addressing each other and taking care of each other and taking care of yourself. Yeah. What? Okay, now this is definitely a challenging question I'm asking now. Mm -hmm. So in her opinion, does she think that humans can maintain, at least potential, maintain this you know, level of love that's experienced in the falling in love state? You know, provided they work on it, provided they're yogis, you know, are somewhat <laughs> conscious of their subtle bodies. <laughs> Does he think this is sustainable or maybe 150%? Okay, she's showing me that it can be attained. But interestingly enough, not what I expected. She's showing me that it's from maintaining that state yourself and learning how to get yourself in a state where you're pumping the oxytocin and dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin yourself. And the more that we are able to do that, that yes, then it's a possibility that that can be maintained. But she keeps showing me don't rely on the other person, that that's where that's like a trap <laughs> where if we're projecting on the other person, and then we're blaming them for why that's not being maintained. <laughs> so yes, it, it's a possibility. She's she's showing me that it's more, not that there's time, but in this dimension, it, it's more in the future where that will be more sustainable, where people right now, she keeps telling me right now we're working on the basics. People are still primarily trapped in the old programs, in the old ways of not having their karma result and all of that but she's showing me that yes in the future even though she keeps saying there's no time in the future that will be more and more that as the vibration raises as people are more healed that they will have that running within themselves and they're not going to be projecting onto the other person you know, why aren't you doing this? If you did this, then I would feel this way. If you did this, I would do that. It's inner work. It's more inner work. And the more people do that, then yes. <laughs> well, I would suggest that, let's say you have, uh, let's say, two partners, right? So and they're both by themselves. They can maintain their vibration very nicely. Right. Mm -hmm. And then they get, you know, together and start running energy together, whatever, rubbing skin or just projecting chi, you know, and synergy is happening. It's better than before. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then uh, will the synergy, I mean, you know, they both have to be already there. But the thing is, only together they can be more than themselves. I think this is where the addiction happens. Of course, when it doesn't happen anymore, then probably the vibration goes down <laughs> and they can't even get to this point. What does she have to say to this? Yeah, ideally having that connection and maintaining that connection, if both partners are healthy, it does expand our awareness, it expands our experience, it expands everything for us and at the same time if the if at some point one or both partners 
does leave the relationship or their their vibration goes down, the more the more synergy there is, the harder that is. And she's telling me love can turn to hate fast because there's so much passion and so much feeling that if one betrays the other or feels rejected by the other, that can really go down fast. It's all about learning. It's all about growth. But yes, ideally, having a relationship where both are balanced and experiencing that synergy expands our worlds much more because then there's that exchange of energy that we can't create on our own. So ideally, yes, that would be phenomenal. Um, Practically speaking, she keeps showing me most people aren't there yet. But some, yeah. Just to give us an idea, let's say out of 10,000 average human beings, you know, on from this planet, uh, how many um, are in in the state like that? Mm-hmm. Out of 10,000. Or do we have to go higher? <laughs> yeah, Five, she, yeah, she keeps showing me the planet mm-hmm. and what looks like it's more percentage based than what she's giving me. Um, she's showing me that less than 20% of relationships on this planet at this time have achieved that state. So it's the majority have not. Um, she's not giving me a number with the 10,000. Um, oh, that's okay. So 20%. Yeah. You know, so that's yeah. better than I thought. Yeah, it's better than I thought. I thought it would be a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, So that's so good. Now, um, of course, she was, you know, um, talking about going from 3D love to a higher vibrational love, where we have 4D and 5D love. So, how could she describe the basic differences to our people, you know, about those levels that we assume? 3D love is based on fear, it's very fear based, it's very greed based. It's very ego-based, very programmed, and it's very um, confining. It feels very, very confining, very restrictive, Mm -hmm. Um, like a trap. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah, as things elevate to, let's say, the fourth dimension, she's showing me there's more support, there's more peace. There's less of the jealousy. There's less of the game playing. She's showing me like games in the third dimension that there's just a lot of nonsense <laughs> and it keeps people trapped as things elevate and and people are communicating better and they're supporting one another and they're not <laughs> interesting, lying, cheating, stealing. Um, they're not doing those types of things that there's a lot more peace for both people or however many people and she's showing me like the the different aspects of our bodies lighting up more there's it feels lighter that trap isn't there and then going up to the fifth dimension where we're loved supported and living in there's not the the fear the fear is gone or at least for the most part gone the balance is there it just the feeling of it is much more grace much more peace and the states of ecstasy are maintained much longer than down in the trap with the games and all the issues so yeah there's definitely differences (laughs) Well, thank you. That was a nice description. I appreciate this. So, of course, uh, a lot of our pain is coming from losing someone that we love, whether it's a pet or a human. So why is this so painful for us? Because we feel we've lost ourselves, a big part of ourselves. The more connected we are with another living being, especially She's showing me the chords that, that we we know happens according 
the connection we pour so much of ourselves into an, another that when we aren't in communion with them in the physical realm, we feel the loss. We we feel the pain, whether it's a parent, a pet, a relationship partner. We feel part of ourselves gone. And this other person or animal or whoever it may be, sometimes if someone's not thinking straight, they blame the other person for the pain they're experiencing. It's a matter of realizing what's going on, clearing the courting, healing any aspects of the relationship, and moving forward. But... Okay, so obviously you know this already. The majority of past loved ones don't want you feeling that pain. Um, it's our own projection of and that feeling that we've lost part of ourselves and we can't get it back. It's the other person has the total control and we can't get it back. It turns to to pain. Huh? No, actually, I you, Raj, you're telling me something new there. Um, I always assumed that this pain of a separation comes from not getting that extra supply of love. So we become addicted, like, you know, to heroin. Yeah, you feel oh, great yeah. when you have it, and when you don't, oh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you're getting into problems. You have withdrawal symptoms. Right. And so, uh, you know, I thought the pain was coming from this. Now, the then you're having actually aspects of yourself in another person. Yes. You know, and through the projection of love, that is a new perspective. And yes. I, I'm very grateful. I don't get new perspectives much. Yes. Anymore. So and I'm very grateful for this. Now, I would say that um, we can ask for those parts of us to come back. Yes. You know, and it will happen. Um, so and that's she gave me a very day. strong yes on that. When, when you said that, I got chills. Yes, that is definitely something that we can do we can call those aspects of ourselves back and heal the part that we feel we've lost and call that back in and she's she's also in agreement with you about when you lose someone and you're no longer getting those hits of the chemical highs of course there's going to be the withdrawal but as far as pain and that that withdrawal is what makes you want to find a way to contact them or connect somehow or go find someone else to replace them to get that back. Um, but that's the addiction part. The pain is from what we've lost of ourselves. And she, when you said that, yes, calling back in the lost parts um, uh. will help heal. Yeah. There will be a video on, on how to deal with love sickness. <laughs> yes, very so, needed. You know, I, I definitely will have to put out one. Um, so I wrote it down. Now, yeah. I also find in my work that when people have a breakup relationship, let's say she dumps him, <laughs> that they also, you know, through the courts, pick up the pain of the rejected person. You yes. know, it's not just your own pain from not having parts of yourself, you know, but it's also you somehow feel the pain of the other. How can you please explain this mechanism, you know, to all of us here? And the more sensitive the person, the more they feel the pain of the other person. And it, it's all the courting and the energy exchange. The longer and more intense the relationship she's showing me, the more emotion that was involved in the relationship, the stronger their, those cords are. And it intentionally working to clear yourself and clear the other person with love and forgiveness is the first step that she's showing me. There's also, oh, wow, that's a whole different, a whole different right. there's a lot of spiritual aspects and there's different spiritual dynamics that, could be playing a role. There could be people putting black magic onto the other person because they're angry. There could be energetic stalking going on, meaning 
somebody intentionally bringing the other person's energy in and then the sensitive person is feeling it and they they can't figure out why can't I get this person off my mind I've cleared all the cords what's going on there's hexes there's curses there's um multi-dimensional beings that may be involved there's a lot so when you're going into a relationship with someone consider who they are <laughs> before you start giving them your energy because you may pay a very high price of a lot of lessons to learn um and it, it those can be very valuable lessons but they can be very difficult but it, as to why we're feeling that it's it's a lot of courting and courting is just the especially if you had sex with someone you're exchanging you're giving them the keys to your energy and they have access to that energy until you clear the cords you work through all of the spiritual aspects you learn how to protect yourself from whatever they may or may not do because because things have broken off there's a lot there's a lot to consider yeah so um, one of the aspects you know of decoding and it's a tough thing definitely a difficult thing and i get a lot of requests to help with decoding because the many individuals by themselves cannot do it it's i mean a really a difficult thing Yes. Now, um, one of the theories I heard, um, and I would like to have a perspective on it, is that um, so when we deposit, you know, our energy into the other person, which will happen, you know, in the exchange of love, sexuality, etc., a strong emotional experience, um, we leave an anchor with the other person. And as long as this other person's energy is within us, they can always record us. You know, you can cut it off or it's going to really go because they still have this anchor. And when this anchor means this other person energy that is still with us is cleared, then um, this will not be possible, at least you know, less possible. How does she see it from her perspective? Yes. Um, the anchor, she's showing me like a hook, like the, the pointy end. <laughs> If there is a pointy, and I don't know anything about anchors, but she's showing me that like a hook part of the anchor. Yes, that is within us after exchanges, especially the more intense the emotions. Emotions play a huge role in how deep the courting is and how deep the connections are. Hmm. And then she's also bringing up the whole twin flame aspect, and that's a whole different topic. Um, but it depends on if there's a divine blueprint that's shared, if there's um, past lives that are shared. But yes, the the anchor, the stronger the connection, the stronger the emotion, the more connection that there was. Yes, it is going to take more time um, and effort to remove that with love but she's saying remove it with love don't going in and just ripping it out in anger and all of that isn't going to help the according will come back the more love that is presented the more forgiveness the more healing for both parties interesting the shorter the time will take in removing the cords that the reattachment comes in when it's done with bitterness. <laughs> it, it's the energy of the removal. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. Things go faster with love. Yes, yes. <laughs> Not Coca-Cola. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, we touched a little bit on the idea before that, you know, it seems that some of the love attraction um, seems to be from the attraction of the opposite. You know, let's say we have like uh, ostrich and, and dripping venusian archetype female, and then we have uh, he man, you know, and they're both, of course, uh, you know, have what the other one doesn't have, and you know, there's a strong attraction to this. And then, then uh, we may have uh, more the androgynous, well, 
I wouldn't call myself on lawlessness, uh, but you know, uh, uh, there is a more male female balance, okay. you know, in the person. And um, so they also uh, have a certain attraction, probably not so much from, you know, the polarities, but by other things. So um, how can she, how does she see this kind of dynamic from her side? Yeah. She's saying both are divine and that both have their purpose, um, that one isn't necessarily higher or better than the other types of relationships, that we're all playing a role in healing. And the, the Venus type that's attracted to the He-Man type that's a whole role, a whole dynamic of healing for the planet if the people heal. It's a whole role healing of those archetypes. And then there's the, the people that are more androgynous, that are more balanced in their masculine and feminine. They're lighting things up. They're, they're bringing more light in. But so is the other couple. It's just a different vehicle of bringing in healing depending on what okay it's depending on what you do with it <laughs> um if you do choose to work on healing then it both light up it's just a different form of light yeah, yeah. well i mean we just turn to the archetypes we live on on gaia on terra yeah, mm -hmm. on earth mm -hmm. and we're dealing with sexual archetype from mars Mm -hmm. and Venus. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you please explain a little bit, you know, how those planetary archetypes of affecting our sexuality, what do they have to do with humanity as such? It, it, it's the astrological influence and the very um, heavy Mars influence on a lot of the masculine traits. Hmm. Uh, she's showing me that it's, of course, based on your birth chart when you come in, when you're when you incarnate, as to how much Mars may affect who you become. Um, and then, of course, Venus, um, the same. It depends on when you're born and it depends on what you're choosing to play out in this lifetime. And the whole Mars Venus role or roles have been huge archetypes for a while on this planet. And it's just a matter of that playing out as far as what the planets have to do, the Mars aspect. Yeah. Well, she's does, does Venus, the, I mean, does the group consciousness of Venus definitely, you know, affect um, the females here? I mean, do they have to say with this? You know, um, are we in a, are the women uh, or whoever I mean who is expected or influenced by the Venus aspect? Is there another entity influencing mm -hmm. you with this consciousness? That's my question. You ultimately. Okay. Yes. Um, interesting. And <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> she's pointing to to me. She's saying you have a lot of Venus placements, which I know, and. <laughs> <laughs> she's, tell, she's telling me, look at your life, um, which it's true. There has been a huge spiritual aspect as to why. And a lot of my clients end up being women that are very similar in the fact that they have heavy Venus placements. Um, and yes, there has been. That's that's a big topic, a very large spiritual component as to this gets into the whole Pleiadian system and the whole belt of Orion. There's there's a whole big spiritual um, aspect to it that would take a long time to get into. But yes, the more Venus placements, there tends to be more connection to in the female to the Pleiadian, Pleiadian the seven sisters, and the whole dynamic that went on where the seven sisters were trying to get away and then you had the orion trying to get them back that whole dynamic is playing out still um yeah <laughs> so you're doing the business of the gods here on the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> 
on the Earth plane, the proxy world of the Pleiadians. Now, okay, I have Mars conjunct with my sun sign. Mm. Uh, it's a good thing I'm a Cancer. I had birthday yesterday. So, um, 69 years, by the way. And uh, but uh, so how <laughs> how does the Mars consciousness you know, plug into the higher celestial energies? I'm. She's showing me more of Orion when it comes to Mars. I know nothing about astrology. I shouldn't say nothing, but I'm just going off of what she's telling me. I know very little about astrology. She's showing me like Orion's belt, the stronger um, aspects. The, she's showing me like the real strong, capable, direct um, type of energy coming from Orion. Um, and that it plays a huge important role on the planet, um, obviously of getting things done, of moving things forward. It's very, very, very needed. And at the same time, it's learning the balance. And often it's through people with Venus placements that the balance can be experienced and learned. And that we're learning from each other and growing and moving on and as we're doing that we're healing um upper realm aspects as well we're playing it out here on earth yeah mm -hmm. well i mean you say you know nothing about orion so what i know about orion is they have a bad rap oh, they have a bad reputation of and being, you know, the what's this Orion Confederation, and maybe Mantis or certain fraction, uh, some grace, tall grace, low grace, you know, that are trying to control humanity and enslave them, bringing us to a, a cyber, you know, basically consciousness, uh, you know, AI slaves, so to say. And of course, there you are know, some uh, Orions are also uh, good. Um, yeah, you know, that's why uh, the some of the pyramids they are aligned with Orion. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah. of course, you know, and not all New Yorkers are good. Not all New Yorkers are bad. You know, right. It's the same thing. So, uh, <laughs> so does she refer there now to the good Orion or bad Orion, or is it the same with the male archetype? You know, and the good. low vibration yeah. male archetype, your wife Peter and. As a you know, high vibrational male archetype, you are, you know, uh, maybe a provider. You know? Right. So yeah, she's showing. Yeah, she's showing me that not all Orion, like you were saying, not all of it is low vibrational. There are some very benevolent Orion beings, and they're very needed to get that assertiveness to get things moving. Um, yes, there are some that are of the lower vibration, and that's that's part of duality but if that energy can be shifted into using the strength to move the planet forward and there are benevolent beings from orion or that are associated with orion and they're more needed because it does move things forward she's showing me like the type a the let's go let's do the doing um yeah that is very needed Mm -hmm. So now, the way I understand what she just said is that um, when we have a strong mass, like me, in, in our chart or any mass alignment, um, we should, um, so we have a stronger you know, resonance with the Orion energy and we better make sure that we align with the good guys and not the bad guys. Is that yes. correct? So yes. because, I mean, you know, military mass, you know, is, is Orion energy and um, the military is not necessarily, you know, considered a very loving organization. Right. And so uh, probably they're dealing a lot with the darker side. You know, oh, we got to win, doesn't matter how, you know. Uh -huh. So the, the dark guys, you know, they have better... Uh, flick knives off. <laughs> no, they use the dark stuff, the dirty tricks, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, is, does she agree with this kind of this oversimplification? Absolutely, yes. And those that are aware and that are that have heavy Mars placement that are associated with Orion that are awake and moving forward with the light they're highly needed she's showing me like a 
like a crown, like we need you, you know, that type of energy because right now, hmm, interesting. Okay. We're going into patriarchy. Um, the lower, the lower level Mars archetype, she's showing me that's what's kept us trapped in that system of patriarchy where, where the masculine is aligned with force and greed and war and destruction and if that energy can be harnessed to move forward with light, the ascension will, will speed up quite a bit. Um, so the more that that's available, the better it is. Okay, thank you. Well, the next question is, um, why is domestic violence so common? And let me just give a little uh, comment here. Uh, again, you know, this must be a woman asking this question. Uh, but... <laughs> Let me find the perspective here. So in my perspective, observation, you know, the wife beater archetype is, of course, the lower vibrational male, mm. you know, and this one is matched, you know, by the bitch, you know, the archetype of lower vibrational female, <laughs> you know, and of course, the, the wife beater, you know, has uh, superior generally through higher upper body strength, you know, and the bitch, you know, is so generally emotionally superior. <laughs> so it's a perfectly um, like Roman style gladiator sport, you know, where they're unequal, but everybody has his own home advantage. So what's her, um, you know, comment on, on the low vibration um, aspects? Um, yeah, that it's very obvious, it seems obvious, but that it's very aligned with the service to self. Um, consciousness and that wife beaters she's she smiles when you say that she's she's wanting to use a different term but i'm not she's not telling you what it is um, it's funny it's funny yeah. it's funny yeah, because it it's is. very it is. sad and, and don't think yeah don't think <laughs> I'm, i don't you know see the suffering and the pain yes. you know that's why i try to keep it you're funny. a healer you're a healer of course you do and um but she's showing me that it's a it's the service to self side even though she's not wanting to really use sides but the influence of the service to self that sometimes these people that are wife beaters or domestic violence where they're physically abusive emotionally abusive sometimes they're being controlled on some level by the service to self whether it's artificial intelligence um other mind control mechanisms and they're not even aware of it and then they're harvesting the fear that they cause they're harvesting the anxiety that they cause they're harvesting all that lower vibrational energy that they cause in the other person they're using it to feed the service to self side so it's it's beyond just the human um the human roles playing out there's a, a different aspect as well on a spiritual level where there are energies that feed off of that and it's if people aren't aware they could be playing that out for lifetimes and just continuing that feed if that makes any sense yeah no thank you i mean definitely this has to be cleared you know the yeah. past lifetime uh, offensive yeah. and and stuck aspects of us because whenever there was heavy trauma i find there is something like a residue you could call yeah. it a discarnate a ghost um there yeah. i suggest we do a quick break here now um and, and then pick it up so we're back from our break now and um so if they are, you know, are, uh, let's say um, service to self and service to other self or Orion people, then the same must be with the Venusian people, with the Venusian consciousness. Are we dealing there also with this kind of a duality that there are negative um, Venusian influences um, that Absolutely. are working against the humanity? Yes, definitely. And it's it's a matter of both becoming balanced um but yes there are negative um lower level 
like she's showing me the shadow side of um, the Venusians. And it, of course, any energy can be used for either for the light or for the dark. And yes, there are some that are being used for the service to self side. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and so many times, you know, we kind of get married to our mothers and fathers. So how does the love or the lack of the <laughs> from the mother or father? If, well, maybe let's just ask for the mother and then later on for the father, because I'm pretty sure they're different. Let's say, um, so this is for the men. So how does the lack of love from the mother affect our future romantic relationships. Okay. She's she's feeling that very strongly. It's it it's very sad in the sense that it, there's a lack of nurturing. And because the ideal mother figure would be very nurturing and very giving, very caring. And when that isn't received when you're a child, subconsciously you're going to want to heal that wound and you, if you have no idea why you feel drawn to certain people and then you get into a relationship that's very similar to the way the mother was to the individual in childhood your subconscious is trying so hard to heal that wound, to make that female the nurturing person that you wanted when you were a child. It's like playing it out and hoping for a second chance to heal that wound, to be nurtured, to be cared for, to be just like hugged and held and nurtured and taken care of. And you'll seek someone out a lot of times that will be sought out to get that other person that's very similar to do those things for you and then when it doesn't happen there's bitterness so you, you're picking a cold person basically uh to get the love right so uh, to going through the same trauma again with your partner right. there. to to get a second chance to heal that wound if if it's possible and we don't a lot of people have no okay. idea I mean, yeah why not why not um why they're not attracted to a, a woman then that loves that you know loves to love and loves to give you know where i maybe another person would consider this as smothering you know but there are people that are just starving for this energy um wouldn't that heal faster i mean there seems to be like a, a i would say sabotage in there Right. Yes. I mean, how can you heal something? Okay. You know, so I have frostbites and, mm -hmm. you know, I want to heal from this. Oh yeah. We put you in a freezer. This is going to, you know, really help you to overcome frostbites. Right. I don't think so. I mean, um, in her opinion, is there a sabotage with this setup? And this could be there, you know, to harvest a luge, you know, to harvest a uh, disharmony <laughs> she's showing me two two different cases in some cases yes it is sabotage to harvest the lower level energies because it triggers that wound over and over and over creating bitterness resentment and all of that lower vibrational energy so yes there that is Sometimes what's going on at the same time she's showing me in other aspects, it's like homeopathy where the light cures the light, where if you're able to express that to the other person and they're able and willing to work through their inability to love and there is a healing, it's like this big, huge clearing and healing. So there's two possibilities. <laughs> Um, depending on how it plays out. Well, that reminds me <laughs> that in many cases, when a woman looks at a man and see like, yeah, maybe in 10, 20 years, I have him trained so he fits my needs. Right, so um, that's a work project there. Right. <laughs> now, okay, now, um, so wouldn't it be better for the man that starts for love, you know, to pick up now? Okay, so I'm attracted to cold women. And, you know, to heal this, hey, but 
let's just get a nice warm one that's just extruding love you know that's um this is you know wouldn't that be a better way to go and just side cut you know just subconscious if, you know, if someone's yeah if someone's aware of what's going on and they've healed aspects of themselves that have those gaping wounds Yes, uh, choosing a partner that is able to assist in that healing, that's able to fulfill those areas that they didn't get nurtured. Ideally, that's beautiful and perfect. But then there's reality of humanity in the third dimension where we seek out subconsciously those that re-wound us in order to have that second chance but it's it's all on that subconscious level we don't intentionally want to harm ourselves it over. looks it looks like sabotage to me so i asked creator to remove those sabotage programs for me yeah. you know i mean i asked for it you know if there's sabotage i like to have it cleared you know yeah. i want to attract you know those things that you know help me to heal in a nice way you know not not healing fire you know by burning even more you know, I don't think, I think there's sabotage there. So yes. if there is, I like to have a change. I put in my vote. Listeners, if you like to have a change, put in your vote. Just say amen, creator, you know, supreme being, absolute supreme being. Please change this till we get the proper medicine. You know? yes. Yeah, homeopathic medicines are work different. You give a tiny, tiny amount. Tiny, tiny, tiny amount, just vibration. You know, you you don't overload them with two buckets full of chemicals. It's it's uh, not that. Mm -hmm. So um, over and over. <laughs> yeah. So how about this over nurturing mm -hmm. um, thing? You know, I mean, so many mothers are over nurturing to their sons. You know, the prince that can't go wrong, and and uh, then of course they're like. You know, I, this is oppressing me. So how to the, do those people turn out, those males turn out? Not so great um, in the sense of not balanced at all. If anything, extremely self-centered, ego-based, expecting the world to continue that pattern of making them the center. And for some... It plays out well in the sense that they they become the center of the universe and they become what the world considers successful. Or there's the other aspect where the world does not respond in that way. It depends on the person, person's gifts, talents, their stations in life. If they go out into the world expecting people to treat them that way and they don't, they'll plummet. And then they'll they'll have that that energy of um, the world has betrayed me. I am a victim, and they they shrink rather than expand. So obviously, a balance would be great <laughs> of nurturing, but not too much. <laughs> so let's an over nurturing mother. Would she basically create a, what's considered narcissists? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that is one possibility. Of uh, There are theories of narcissistic personality disorder being a result of trauma in someone's childhood, but also one aspect can be an over-nurturing environment where that child is made to feel that they are unique, they are special, which all children are, but to an extreme where that inflated sense of ego is created. Yes, that can play a role in narcissistic personality disorder for sure. Hmm. Okay, so let's go to the other side that we just were dealing with uh, men and their mommies. Okay. So let's go to little girls and their daddies that, um, you know, how they turn out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So let's say we have the uh, withdrawn, maybe even violent and abusive daddy. So how does a female in general turn out that has been treated like that? Always seeking the validation, wanting to repeat, again, the, the lesson, repeat the opportunity to be loved, where the, the safety, the security, the stability that she was seeking as a little girl that was never there and 
that can play out in her seeking partners that are almost identical, similar to the way her father treated her in a attempt to heal that wound, ideally um, changing that person and making them into this person that they want them to be. It, it doesn't work that way, but that's what our subconscious does, wanting to seek out, not, not on a conscious level. We, we always say, I'm never going to marry anyone like that. I'm never going to be with someone like that. And yet it plays out and it's the subconscious. Well, as would this then be, you know, the lady that tries harder and starts reading Cosmopolitan and to see what's expected for her? I mean, to put that waste the standard. <laughs> yeah, and it, it could. It's it's more. It's, a lot of it's the the energetic stuff that gets ignored, the clearing, the healing of the family line, the healing the wounds, healing the trauma. Obviously, that's the much more efficient effective way to go <laughs> um to to not attracting and not being drawn to those same types yeah i mean i have to absolutely agree with you um, there is so much stuff so much influence coming from ghosts from mm -hmm. past lovers from past lifetimes from own incarnation from past lifetimes and from enemies that are just trying everything they can to affect our life uh, it's it's just scary it's i have to say it's scary humanity has a lot to catch up and heal but then once this is done uh, it's going to be quite good but there is a lot of catching up to do i have to say <laughs> She's showing me the jumpsuits yeah. again. That's why you're here. <laughs> That's why yeah, right. uh, we, we yeah. decided to fast track. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, you know, we, we're shedding the old and then you'll be growing into the new. So we have, we're growing into 4D, 5D relationships and you know, they're both you now they're committed relationships and they're now open polyamorous concept. You know, there are different uh, sexual communities exploring this. And um, so also, yeah, different sex, sexual combinations. So what's um, her point of view and you know, the differences of the 4D to 5D again? <laughs> she's she's saying no labels, no 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 classifications that that will be removed more and more. Um, and that if someone does choose polyamory versus someone who chooses monogamy, it's what it's the energy of what's going on that matters more than the classifications. It's the energy of bringing in higher love, not the love that is based on fear and greed and all of that. It's more the energy that's created rather than is this group better than this group or is this going to be more elevated than that or is this gender identification better than this one or is this, she's saying remove it all and focus on what energy is being created. Mm -hmm. uh, through the exchange of energy between the people involved. It may be a higher energy for someone to be monogamous. It may be a higher energy for someone not to be. It just, it's the energy behind it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, you yeah. Know, if it helps you become elevated, go for it. If it diminishes you, you know, um, no, stay away, you know, go for the stuff that elevates you. Absolutely. Um, now, how does watching dysfunctional parents, yeah. their relationship, you know, affect our own relationship? And of course, there's always individual causes, but in, in general, you know, what is the effect that we can expect? Mm. And the programming, it, it, in, until we're, what is it, eight years old, um, and especially the smaller, the younger we are, our brains are much more open to the programming as you know like little babies are wide open and small young children we're just absorbing it all and we're storing away this is the way 
this gender behaves in this relationship. This is the way this happens. This, and traumas are stored. We, we take in a lot, um, obviously, and watching dysfunctional parents. Okay, she's also showing me the energy that's created in the house um, or the home of dysfunctional parents. It's very, very, very hard on the children energetically, just the, the constant bitterness, the constant dysfunctional lower chi energy that's in the house. It just takes its toll on the children, obviously. And obviously, and later in life, they may play out that role um, to try and heal it as well. Copycat. Mm. Copycat. They're copying yeah. this. Even though, even though they say they're not going to do that, it ends up being what they do unless the wounds are healed. Yeah. So when you before you get married to somebody, you look at the parents, right? Yes. See the yeah. drama they went through, mm -hmm. and uh, most likely you're going to be in that, you know, uh, what's this? The warm up, mm -hmm. <laughs> the release, the second release. Yes. <laughs> like a yeah, movie part release. Two. <laughs> Yeah, part two, the same thing, you know, more modern Blade Runner, and the next version, so to say. All right, so um, now I think we're getting into more of the skittish stuff. And if you have uh, prudes, you know, here, it's probably, um, you know, or people that are very sensitive, you know, we say goodbye to you now. So please don't feel offended, although we, we try to stay very decent. All right, so that's your chance now. One, two, three. Right. So the next question is, how does sexual abuse or premature sexual activation, you know, affect the romantic life, you know, of when they become adults? Wow. So how does sexual abuse as a child affect? Yeah. You know, the prematureness, I would say. You know, yeah. It's like before oh. your age, sexual maturity. Okay, she's feeling it before I'm getting words, and it does not, it, it's a very horrible, um, obviously a very horrible feeling um, as to, as far as how it affects people, just she's showing me the sacral chakra and all the, the lower vibrational um, darkness that is there. The it just feels really heavy, really yucky, and of course, she's showing me the mind what it does to the mind of a young child, especially and the heart. There's so much damage that's done, um, if a child is sexually abused, and she's saying, and it can be healed. Um, not to feel that there's you know no hope if that happened. And to remember the bigger the wound, the bigger the healing, the bigger the purpose. So she's not wanting people to feel like, oh, God, if that happened to me, you know, that that means I'm damaged. I'm horrible. And all of that. That's not it. it it's an opportunity to heal a huge trauma. Um, and by doing that to heal so much more, um, but it affects the children greatly. And as they get older and they play that out, obviously they may be hypersexual as teenagers. And she's showing me it can go either or, either they may choose to gain weight or dress a certain way to repel that energy so it never happens to them again, or they may become hypersexualized and play that out over and over and over and over. Um, but it's a matter of healing, healing the wound that's there. It's opportunity for healing. Mm -hmm. So let's say, um, you know, let's say we run into a, a partner mm -hmm. uh, where we know, um, well, this lady or this young man, you know, were sexually abused. Mm -hmm. Um, should we just drop him as damaged good and oh my god, this is such a work project, you know, this is never yeah. going to end. And, uh, you know, we're going to be old <laughs> before this is all worked out and, you know, you know, yeah. we blew our best years here on this drama. Or um, 
you know, and what are the, you know, really effective methods of, of healing something like this? How do you do this? You know, what do you look for? What do you focus on? Yeah, she's, she's saying it varies from person to person. It, you know, the, the first question of should we just not get involved if we know that that's, that wound is there? It depends on how much work the person has done regarding it if they've done any work at all are they still playing that out over and over in their lives are they playing the role of the victim that this is what happened to me and now i'm vindictive and i'm mad and i'm going to hurt people because of it and are they playing that role are they playing which role are they playing how are they handling it are they willing to get healing have they done healing um and as far as how to heal that wound wow that's she said there there are multiple ways um energy healing is obviously very effective and faster there are other methods such as emdr going back and um, working through the trauma, but the things like cognitive behavioral talk therapy and all of that, she's showing me it won't provide ultimate healing in most cases that energy needs to be healed as well. The body, the mind, the soul, the spirit all need to be addressed, not just the mind. Um, energy healing, shamanic healing, doing soul retrieval, um and just working there are some healers that that do focus on that primarily the healing of sexual trauma um and just going through and seeing which fits per situation and she's saying certainly don't just discard someone if they've had childhood sexual trauma because she's saying, unfortunately, it's more common than we like to think um, or like to even know on this planet. And the more people heal from it and say, this is where it stops, it stops with me, then the family line can heal. Yeah, I mean, if you would ask me, um, I would say you have to send a lot of love. Yeah. You know, just the purest heart love that you can access, you know, if it's from source, that's the best mm -hmm. and then send it nourish the chakras with this yes and, and cleanse them and nourish you know and nourish them again and again and um yeah. so now how about you know rape and you know rape and then of course also how does rape you know affect romance not just you know the root chakra and but also the heart chakra mm -hmm. how 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 can something like this in this of course it, you know in a, a simplification whatever answer you want to bring but so many um, women have been raped it's not you know festive anymore so um, you know what does she say she's showing me earth and she's showing me the way that humanity has treated the mother that we live on and we've raped her for her resources we've raped her for our own pleasure our own supply our own what we think are our needs and that's what has been playing out with the females a lot in this dimension where it's that energy of taking and not caring about the feminine energy and just that force that it's all about me i'm going to take what i want attitude and as far as it how, how it plays out how it affects someone and it really depends on the life journey of the person it really depends on how much they're willing to go back and heal but if it, it affects the heart a lot um, obviously, it closes off the heart chakra. She's showing me almost like a cage. Like, I don't ever want to experience that again. So I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to look a certain way. And a lot of times it, it goes to self-blame, which it wasn't ever 
<laughs> that's never where the where it lies. It's in the energy of force and greed and taking um, where that's what needs to be healed. But it affects the heart chakra a lot, obviously the sacral chakra as well, and the root chakra, all the chakras, and the connection to source, because often in this, depends on what culture you're, you're in, we see God as masculine. And if this masculine has come in and done this to me, I'm not having anything to do with God. Um, so it, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it just, it can affect people profoundly. And yet <laughs> she keeps saying, and it's a profound way to heal. So she's wanting people to be encouraged, even if they've been through rape, that you can take that. And she's saying, be an alchemist, turn that into one of your greatest strengths the more that you're able to heal and overcome that. She's showing me a bunch of sparkles, the more sparkly that you'll become. So it's not, you don't have to leave it as a negative. You can turn it into an absolute positive and then you can use that positivity to help others that have been through it as well. Yeah, the shame and death principle. Yes, yeah. You you experience the trauma, you learn how to heal it, and then you can assist others. Others, and in, as many of my clients, this was one reason why this was chosen. Of course, there was also you know many times it's karma in, in male incarnations. You know we raped and plundered, and then as females, you know we we get the revenge. And of course, also many times we you know rape happens through old enemies. You know where like a revengeful ghost steps into the other person and then he works through them and you know afterwards they can oh, what happened you know i'm so sorry i don't do this kind of stuff you know so um, it's not always necessary personal um, but then this aspect that um, you know the women take the hit for the abuse of the earth the rape of the earth well, that's a new one for me a relatively new i mean you know the idea of this connection uh, makes a lot of sense to me here. and <clears throat> It makes her very, very sad. Every time that's brought up, she just feels this heaviness and she keeps connecting yeah, it back yeah, to yeah. her. Keeps I, uh, connecting it back to like showing the trees being just ripped out and, you know, all of nature just being disregarded. Um, and she keeps connecting it back to that. Yeah. Yeah, we are connecting. I mean, we're turning the mother nature into a parking lot. Yeah. And uh, we, the humanity is spreading out on this planet like a cancer. We're metastasizing along the waterways and along the streets, the roads, you know, just building colonies and gobbling everything up and all the resources and polluting everything. It's just like a cancer cell. And so, you know, here um, we're becoming raped and get cancerous as a humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot of clearing to be done. Um, yeah, so uh, I think there has to be a lot of apology for humanity to be done to, to clear this, mm -hmm. yeah. to clear this. And so, yeah, please everybody look at their own life. You know, how much do we actually care, you know, for the Earth Mother? You know? yeah. and so see a correlation, you know, we're all connected. And this is what is meant, you know, we're all connected. You know, these things do not happen disconnected oh so oh, now i'm like oh let's smile here <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that was heavy it that just... was really really heavy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we asked the angels to please you know clear and um, you know all this uh, energy you know where humanity just unconsciously just takes advantage of mother earth you know not seeing her as an object not seeing her as a conscious being you know, seeing as like a piece of meat, so to say, you know, to satisfy our needs, you know. Um, we apologize, you know, for our own personal perspective, for, um, and as well as for our ancestors um, and, you know, humanity. Um, you know, we ask as much be forgiven, you know, of these offenses to you, to us, and then also removed from Mother Earth. Um, yes. um, you know, we're given the angels' permission. 
Amen. Yes. You, and if you agree, the viewers, please say Amen and, you know, give them more ammunition. And so it is. Swaha. Amen. Oh, okay. So, love and heart chakra opening. Um, please tell us a little bit more from your perspective. As far as how love affects the heart chakra opening or how opening the heart chakra provides love. Uh, it's a cross relationship, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. The more that we're open to love, the more that we heal our own heart chakra and learn how to open that heart chakra, which she's saying and Wolfgang teaches that well. Um, opening the heart chakra is one of the highest callings and once we're able to do that <laughs> and the love extends to all of creation it's not just about the what's in it for me i need to find the ideal partner to have all these happy feelings we become more of aware that we're just one with all of creation and and like you had mentioned before, being in nature can be just as fulfilling, if not more so, of a love relationship because you feel the love of all creation around you because your heart chakra is open and you're just you're at peace. You're you feel the love back from nature as much as you're able to give. Yeah. Well, you're not having an orgasm. That's you know. No. You gotta really run some love with a good pine or something like this. You get to this. <laughs> and that's where it gets weird. <laughs> and you go away from sexual archetype programming. Yeah. Too. <laughs> uh, how about uh, chords? You know, the chording, um, you know, uh, affecting relationship. You know, have a you know describe a little bit how they're formed, how they act. You know, both ways, mm -hmm. so people understand, please. Courting happens, and again, she's showing me like she was before, that a lot of times the courting, the stronger the cord, it's more emotion was involved. She keeps telling me emotion. The higher the emotion, by higher, the more intense the emotion, whether it's really intensely bad, such as in instances of rape where there's that horrible experience, but it's highly emotionally charged that courting can be very strong as well as in experiencing really really good emotions of absolute bliss that courting can be very strong and if those two are combined the cords she's showing me get really tangled um if you have from someone both the absolute horrible experience and then also bliss intertwined that cord can be really difficult to remove but it can be removed um but courting she's telling me courting happens most through emotions and courting can happen from a distance if there's an emotional connection it doesn't necessarily have to be physical obviously physical it becomes even stronger but even if you're with someone physically, but there's very little emotion, there's not going to be as thick of a cord, as heavy of a cord um, as there will be if there's emotion involved in the cording. Yeah, she's showing me, you know, the back um, is where the cording can be attached even unintentionally, like someone not even aware that they're being corded by someone else. And just being aware that courting does happen and keeping your energy centers clear, um, clearing yourself of courting, asking Archangel Michael for assistance is really, really beneficial. So how would we know that we're being courted? Mm, depends on how sensitive the person is. Um, sometimes it can be felt and how aware that someone is of courting and what it feels like when you're being courted um the more aware that you become of what it feels like the more you can remove it rather quickly before it gets really ingrained um but if you're totally unaware you may feel drained and you may start feeling almost sick 
and then able to think clearly because there's somebody out there just drawing your energy through the cords. Um, you may have thought patterns that aren't yours. There, there could be a multitude of ways that the courting is experienced, or you may feel extreme heart pain if the other person is feeling it, and you don't know why. <laughs> So it depends on how aware the person is um, of mm -hmm. courting and how sensitive they are. Yeah, correct. You know, the more sensitive you are, then the, the more you can discriminate. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, knowledge is power in that sense. Right. Now, um, you, you, you know, you said that um, <clears throat> um, we can be courted without us actually being involved in it or being aware of it. So let's say a, a, a public personality right now, you're um, in, on YouTube and we don't know how many people in the future, you know, will see you, maybe even fall in love with you, you know, and so um, uh, could they court you and uh, how would that you know, affect you and what to do against it? I mean, I've, you know, we, we want to do the work, but we don't want to be sucked dry by, yes. you know, vampiristic uh, admirers. Yes, and I, I have actually experienced this as, and I know you probably have as well, um, where you, you are aware, at least we're aware that that happens. And yes, there can be people out there and it could, it's not even just public personalities. It, you can be an attractive male or female and walk down the street and have people projecting towards you with, and they don't always know what they're doing. It's not like they're intentionally sending cords out a lot of times. It's more they're thinking certain thoughts about you, they're desiring you, they're wanting to connect, they're wanting to create a connection, whether they're consciously thinking that or not, it's what's going on. And that energy reaches for you and can cord you if someone's aware of energy and they know what they're doing, of course, it, it can be more effective. The good news is if you're aware of that aspect of reality, you can protect yourself through energy shielding, through um, breathing that psychic bubble of protection, calling in your angels, being aware of it daily. It's like a daily hygiene practice, like brushing your teeth. You have to keep it going. <laughs> you can't just do it once and be done. It's something that does need to be kept up. Yeah, I definitely heard, you know, that some nice looking clients of mine, you know, when they go to the beach in the bikini, they're completely drained afterwards, yes. <laughs> you know, because they're courted by lusty males. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, of course, it spoils it for everybody. It's kind mm -hmm. of sad that this happens. Mm -hmm. So um, let's just talk some little bit more about lust. So um, second chakra seems to be, first and second chakra seem to be, you know, the, the party house there. So uh, what kind of a balancing action, you know, does happen there, uh, you know, through the last energy? Balancing action? Um, meaning why? Okay, I'm not, I'm not picking up what you mean. What kind of? Well, I mean, you know, there is an exchange somehow. Mm -hmm. you know, there is there is a mixing of energies. So I'm not sure whether we can kind of synergizing, <laughs> you know. But there is, uh, you know, some balances are being changed, you know, from one level to another. Something is happening there. Okay. Uh, okay. You know, so please, yeah, describe from your perspective. You know, we humans, we know maybe about the physical body, but uh, we're kind of still third eye blind on the astral plane. So that's why where you come in, right? Okay. Um, as far as lust, obviously, there's the, the obvious of it being for procreation, for being that energy that propels us forward to seek out a mate. Um, so it, she's saying it's not bad. Lust isn't a negative. It's when it's taken to extremes, when it's taken, and that's one of the, okay, um, one of the only things that's nourished. And she's saying that being too much in the energy of lust, it's like having an appetite like for food and acknowledging, yeah, that's part of normal existence as a human being. It's what you do with it. It's what you feed yourself. If you realize, hey, I'm really hungry and you keep going through 
and only eating fast food um, in the sense she's showing me like porn. If you're, if you're feeling less, <laughs> feed the fast food, fast food, fast food, fast food, you're going to get unhealthy. You're, you're only going to be in it for what it tastes like in the moment. It's going to make you feel sluggish and downtrodden and all the yucky stuff. And you're going to want it more because you develop a taste for it where the um, nutritious food doesn't taste good to you because you're so used to the lower vibrational food. So she's saying lust isn't bad. It's a hunger, just like physical hunger for food. And it's what you feed that hunger if you feed it very high quality nutritious food and balance it with the rest of your life you're not just eating all day long <laughs> um that it's a very positive thing obviously for even creativity and pleasure and creation it's a beautiful positive energy it's what you do with it <laughs> that matters so, <clears throat> of course, I mean, thank you that this is really good information. Um, so, you know, some of our biggest trauma in this life, you know, seem to be, you know, love relationship, you know, breaking up. You know, yeah. after all, I mean, money is one thing, but without having somebody that you love, this all seems very shallow. Yeah. Um, so, what is... You know, maybe one more time. So, what is happening um, when you, and yeah, and I found um, that getting dumped, you know, makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, so, you know, I uh, <laughs> started acting like a complete ass if I wanted to break up with somebody. So, you know, there wasn't this type of rejection. They, they would leave voluntarily. I think there was a way out. I'm not saying this was ideal, but this is what I used to do. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, can you explain more what happens when people break up? What happens from her perspective, and why does it, you know, again hurt so much? And what to do about it? Yeah, again, she's showing me that there's a loss of part of ourselves, depending on how deep the relationship was, and how long it went on, and how much of a connection there was, how much of ourselves we poured into the other person, whether it was a healthy pouring or not, we still gave part of ourselves away to the other person. Energetically, spiritually, physically, we've given of ourselves. So when that's done, when it's gone, and especially if there's rejection on top of it, it's like there's part of us that's been taken and we feel extreme pain. And there's a blow to the ego because we've been rejected. And so it's like a combination, a horrible combination of, <sighs> she's showing me like a mixed drink, like this horrible toxic mixed drink that you have to drink mm -hmm. and it just makes you feel like you want to throw up and you just want to get rid of it, but you can't get rid of it. But the... Um, the reason it's so painful is because the primary reason is there's part of yourself that you've given away. And it's well, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I probably also would say um, a lot of um, the pain that hasn't been processed from past lifetimes. So yes, absolutely. Also plugs in, in there. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, oh God, it's a difficult question on her. But uh, just to give us a gross estimate. Let's say in a breakup, you know, let's say if you experience 100% pain, now in average, how much of this would be from past lifetimes that's just being triggered? Mm, past lives, a pretty high percentage. Like 70, 80%? Mm -hmm. I was hearing 80. Um, yeah. Because most people aren't aware of past lives and karma and all of that. And we keep doing it over and over and over and over and over and it builds up. Um, so yeah, it's a, a significantly high percentage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why the feeling, you know, just the slight breakup and suddenly you feel like you got hit with a ton of bricks. <laughs> you know, it's ah. all that stuff from past lifetimes. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, so there are psychologists, um, you know, that they record um, couples, you know, on videos, and then they analyze it, and they claim that they can predict if a couple will stay together, you know, by even just um, analyzing this um, a few minutes of interaction, you know, and they call this their focus on micro emotions. So what happens within a second time period? So they look at second second slices. And, um, and, you know, this, they say they can, um, with over 90% accuracy, you know, predict you know, whether <laughs> the couple will stay together for at least two years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, and um, they say, um, you know, the model basically, uh, you know, they just quantify and say if they are, uh, let's say, uh, if there's a certain proportion of negative emotional exchange, you know, versus positive emotional thing, you know, that threshold somewhere, that lays somewhere, um, is crossed, you know, the relationship is breaking up. So, um, so we're having here positive versus negative emotional exchange and the trigger point. How does she see it from her perspective? <laughs> What she was saying is they'll tell you who they are up front within seconds. Often a person will show you, and that's why these psychologists are able to see it as well as the the exchange that people tell on themselves up front. And they will say, I may not be, you know, I may be damaged goods or I may not communicate well, or they tell people up front. But because as humans, we're wanting that morphine of love so badly, we put on the rose-colored glasses and we ignore. But she's saying that, yes, it, within a short period of time, it can be predicted if a relationship is going to last and be healthy or not, because people will say up front who they are. We just often choose not to see it. Yeah, I actually looking into retrospect. Uh, yeah, I find this to be true. Yeah, <laughs> you know, people will tell you. Yeah, they tell you about their crazy parents and, mm -hmm. and, and this and that, and you know, and you just they are all right. <laughs> you know, but I but can feel this one. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Often, it, you know? Yeah, healers often think that that I can take care of this. I can heal this, and it's not our job to go into a relationship to heal someone. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I wasn't to say, I mean, I was younger there and, and I, you know, I knew, uh, yeah, it's, I'm going to go into a relationship and the separation is going to be difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, you know, this is the price I will have to pay. You mm -hmm. know, it's better than no relationship. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I still stand with, you know, those decisions that I made there. So, you know, I always found it was worth the price to pay. At least, yeah, but maybe I was lucky. So, <clears throat> um, now, Raj, um, please, you know, from your perspective, um, what are the most three important factions or factors for a successful romantic relationship? Communication is the number one that she's showing me. And she's talking about, she's showing me different aspects of communication. Communication physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. If that communication is super strong, then there is a higher probability that people can work through their problems because as she's showing me a backpack, everybody comes with a backpack of their problems. And is that person willing to communicate, willing to learn and grow with you? So communication heart chakra is the second how open is the person's heart chakra and are they so closed down that even if they are willing to verbally communicate that that heart chakra is just not open it's it's not it won't be easy so communication heart chakra <laughs> strangely enough she's showing me happiness um which isn't what i expected um but the the willingness, the openness of the other person to express happiness as well. So what was the first one? Communication, heart chakra and happiness 
are the three things she says, if those are there and people are willing to work through their backpack with each other. And if that backpack <laughs> is um, lighter than the happiness and the love that they carry, if the love outweighs the trauma, if you're willing to take on their problems because everybody has them, if it out, if it outweighs the negative, then it will last. That was a roundabout way to get there. <laughs> yeah. So, ah, yeah. Uh, so many people um, are, you know, thinking that when they meet their twin flame, when they're gonna ride into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> And um, of course, um, you know, even with my own clients, you know, there, there have been some pretty big disappointments, <laughs> mm -hmm. especially when the twin flame has a lot of bad habits. <laughs> and it's not the vibrational match. Right. And um, so, and it's like really difficult, you know, they're already married, have kids and live right. completely somewhere else. So what are your comments on, you know, the, our expectation, you know, on having a fulfilled love relationship with the twin flame? The, the twin flame journey is not about romantic love. It's not the Disney movie love that you find your twin flame and everything's happy ever after. And it's not even the twin flame journey that is so perpetuated in the spiritual community that there's this runner, there's this chaser, and eventually it'll all work out and everybody's going to be happy. From what Raj has shown me numerous times, it's about soul lessons. It's about a soul that chooses to incarnate in multiple bodies to fast track the lessons that they want to learn whether they want to learn compassion. So they go into multiple different bodies. This person's going to be a soldier and get injured. And then they learn compassion for injured soldiers. This one's going to go live in poverty. So they learn the lesson of poverty. They have fast tracked the lesson of compassion by being in two separate situations. So a twin flame connection is not always a romantic connection. Sure, there can be times where twin flames do become romantic partners, but that's not what the twin flame journey is about. It's about learning lessons, fast tracking the lessons that we've chosen to, to live out and learn in this lifetime. So in other words, um, twin flame is a lot of work. You know, it's a high stakes gamble, a lot of work. And if you make it, it's great. And um, otherwise, you know, you try it. <laughs> and it's all learning lessons, even the concept of making it versus not making it. If one twin flame is epically in low vibrational energy, that's still a huge lesson for your soul. So it, it all works out. It just may be painful <laughs> as a human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. So in, in general, it seems that, you know, all our romantic um, relationships here um, are just, you know, projects, work projects. Um, in my opinion, um, this earth incarnation right now is not a pleasure incarnation, not at all. If you're looking for a pleasure incarnation, <laughs> you're in for some rough surprises <laughs> this is definitely maybe one of the most interesting times you know for many thousands of years to live in and if you have any idea of you know history maybe even the hidden history you know you will get a better understanding and appreciation for this being a witness here at this time but again if you're thinking um you know that love is here you know for pleasure this is you know the honeymoon time no, there are other incarnations for this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's why I recommend, you know, make sure you got the line to source, to the love of source that makes this, our stay here on this world uh, livable. It's like morphine, you know, you can overcome the pain with the love of source. And you're not dependent on somebody else to get your love. That's probably the most. Mm -hmm.